Hello, everybody. My name is David Reed. Welcome to Dial the Gate, episode 189 of the Stargate Oral History Project. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. For the next hour, we have uh, we have Kathleen Monroe on uh, the show, and she's going to take us uh, uh, through her career and talk about her time on Stargate Universe and answer your fan questions. But before we get into thick of it, if you enjoy Stargate, and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, please click that like button. It will help the show continue to grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops. And you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. As Kathleen is with me live, we'll be able to go ahead and and um, get uh, uh, our moderating team, who I believe is uh, uh, Anthony and uh, Jeremy today, uh, in the YouTube chat. So if you're on the YouTube chat with us, live watching the show, submit your questions to Kathleen over there, and I will get them uh, over to her. In the meantime, let's go ahead and bring in Miss Kathleen Monroe, who played Amanda Perry in Stargate Universe. Kathleen, again, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for your interest in the in the show ongoing i mean it's it's really it's really cool to see um yeah to see a dedicated presence to this franchise you know it went on for 17 seasons of television yeah. and uh something that is around that long uh I, i've had this conversation with dean devlin who created the the movie uh, mm -hmm. with Roland, Roland Emmerich, and he wasn't thrilled necessarily with the direction they took the show, but even he had to admit, 17 seasons, something's something's working. Yeah. You know? uh, how, what was your familiar with, familiarity with Stargate before SGU? So I have to admit, not robust. Okay. I, um, I, was, uh, I was a Star Trek TNG fanatic. So that's like my, yes. my like, world around like this kind of content is like, so concentrated in that space like when i was you know teenager kid i went to conventions i did the whole thing i have i still have like action figures and boxes and phasers <laughs> and headquarters all so all you're a sci-fi fan oh yeah awesome. i mean yes and, and especially especially that show so stargate was something like i think i um yeah i i had like sort of seen little bits and pieces i was aware of it for sure um, but I really dove in to get familiar before uh, before jumping in to um, to join them on on SGU. What did you think of the um, the uh, the storytelling idea of using a, a Stargate to to journey to other planets? It's it's up there with the Enterprise in terms of uh, uh, st uh, the 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 how how to how to create such as a strong adventure, you know, endless possibilities, you know, there's, there are a few other tools like that in sci-fi, I think. Totally. And I think it's like a testament to the world building that we just buy it off the top. Like, it's just like, it's such a, um, it's so, so well established in the way they sort of build the world around that premise is just um, really successful, I think. But yeah, it's cool. I mean, it, it like, it lights up the imagination the way that the best sci-fi stuff does, right? And you go like, imagine if and then the possibilities like you said are sort of endless and i think what i really loved about sgu in particular and uh is how human they made that yes. question you know for better and like, for worse for better and for worse yeah and i'm curious yeah i know yeah i'm 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 a little aware of the better and worse for for viewers <laughs> um i think for me that's kind of what uh what was the most compelling aspect about thinking about that technology is like just how would that impact real people doing mm -hmm. these these missions or or you know the real relationships that exist around that that uh, premise well one of the things that i love about stargate as opposed to star trek is that it's set in the now and you yeah. can have characters like quadriplegics be an yeah. integral part of the story like we haven't gotten past um, yeah. that, that situation yet where we, you know, we're all, 
we're all and unless you know unless Worf's getting you know hit by a yeah. by a by something and you know not not able to move his legs you know in the future those those problems aren't there anymore and yeah. we your story and it's one of the things that I want to talk to absolutely is about the character's disability and then suddenly getting to be in this body um, mm -hmm. it's it's so compelling as an audience because we can put ourselves there and and see ourselves in those circumstances yeah i thought it was a really beautiful and complicated idea and i think i think what the show did well that appealed to me about the character was it's not saying like her life is empty when she's in the chair in fact it's quite the opposite like her her mental acuity is sort of what defines her and her, she has a personality and she mm -hmm. has romance and there's this um you know there, there's an, a, a scene in the first episode that i did with david blue talking about um about how amanda had this crush on rush and and he kind of looks at her like askance and and she's like what you don't think that people you know who are in wheelchairs can have romantic feelings for people mm -hmm. and he's like no, no no i'm just surprised that it's him that you have romantic feelings <laughs> right he's lived with him for weeks yeah. at this point <laughs> Yeah, so I think the way that that was handled to not say, hey, this is the dream fix that we can totally remove this obstacle for you and now your life suddenly has meaning. Rather, they were saying there's meaning to your life and now you're experiencing life in a body in a way that you haven't since. I think and since I think uh, they had it that Amanda was maybe nine when she had her injury. Nine so, years old. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it w it did that really nice job of not um, not condemning the experience of of having um, an, an injury that would mm -hmm. result in being in a um, in a chair the way that Amanda was, and also offers an opportunity to discover physicality, which was a really really fun thing to play. I want to talk about this so much more. I want to sit this aside uh, and and go uh, earlier into your history. But before I do that, who was your favorite TNG character? Oh, okay. This, I hate to admit that this is because it's a crush, but Riker, like I was a Riker head <laughs> too. Then. And I met Jonathan Frakes once. It was actually around the time that I was on SGU. Okay. I met Jonathan Frakes at a convention. So like not even remotely in a work capacity, just in a pure fan capacity. I paid the money to get a photo with him. I have a photo signed by him with me in it. And I like my, I think the things that kind of touch us when we're young never die you know right and he was like my i i had like the novelizations based on like his relationship with troy like the yeah. like the book called imzadi that like was this epic that i would dive into when i was a kid because he was just um such an appealing character to me i think if i went back and looked at it now i, I might um i might shake out differently but the heart wants what it wants of course absolutely <laughs> have you seen picard i have seen picard yeah and I think wasn't it good yeah Oh, oh, what so an good. ending! The last, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, I, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, Picard as a as a character is just like one of the greats of all time. I think. Oh so. yeah, and what an honor to have a series named after you. And, and season three was just perfect. Yeah. It was uh, yeah. uh, uh, almost perfect. Yeah. How did you? What, how old were you when you knew that you wanted to act and perform? I think I was pretty young when I came to it. I was a really really shy kid like really really shy and really kind of nerdy kid and and i um i just i, I went to a, a summer camp program that was like music art and drama and the drama part i played music and i did you know a little bit of art on my own and stuff but those were sort of solitary and then right. drama was the thing that when i i re realized you could be on stage and you could communicate and it didn't have to be your words you didn't have to come up with things um, which I was always just really like sort of sort of shy about. Um, I felt I felt really opened up. Like I felt a sense of of, of freedom. And I was I think I was about five the first time I went to that. Wow, that you were yeah. young. Yeah, yeah. And it, I I remember they would they made all the five year olds because it was a camp. Like five was the youngest age. And and uh, and it's my hometown, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And um, the five-year-olds all had to be trees. Like we didn't have, we didn't have lines at that point. When we just had trees, and I was like, I'm gonna be the best darn tree. Like I had like practiced at home, and I just like I just felt like there was a way to show up there that I wasn't quite confident enough, maybe, to show up 
um, in my in my real life. So from there, I, I would always try to do little theater things here and there. And then it wasn't until my teen years when I was doing a lot of like high school theater, community theater, anything I could kind of get my hands on in that in that realm. But also not living in a city where professional theater was was a dominant industry. Yeah. I was you know thinking about what I want to do with my life, and I was like, man, I just love this the best like this is just what I and um and I I'll <laughs> I credit and I have an uncle who's a screenwriter and he came to see me in a play because my parents wanted his input on whether or not I stood any chance at all of making any money or if I would be you know broken and, and um and regretting uh pursuing acting and I remember he watched the play he watched me in the play I was about 16 and I was like, you know, what do you think? Like, should I pursue acting? Should I pursue something else? And he said, pursue acting. Worst case scenario, you'll read the news somewhere. <laughs> and I was like, that's good enough for me. Right. You well, know, it was I'm, like, yeah. That's just great. I, I'm always surprised, and I guess I shouldn't be, at how many um, introverts are uh, find a way to... Uh, access themselves in front of an audience when they're yeah. given dialogue and and positions on the stage that someone uh, uh, else has already planned out like yeah. the 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 freedom of an introvert and I do consider myself one at least partly uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to just let go and and just be with a group and compose a story and step outside of yourself yeah. it's I don't know why it's so freeing but yeah. it really, it really is. I mean, you do this too, right? Like you're, you're visible on this, on this show. You, right. you put your, your, your thoughts and your self and your, you know, in some sense, creativity into these conversations. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I recognize that it's like, there's, yeah, I, 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 I can't quite explain it. I think for me, it almost felt like permission or something. Yeah. It felt like permission to like show up and also, because the parameters were set, the pressure was just off a little bit, you yeah. know, where personally I would feel, I would kind of clam up. Um, so yeah, it's, I, yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I think there is sometimes an assumption that actors are also really interested in like getting a ton of attention and like being the, mm -hmm. you know, the center of attention at a party or being, being extroverted. And that's, that's surely true. And I, and I do appreciate, um, you know, people who engage in my work and I, I like the community around it, but I'm also like, I was asked once to MC a wedding and I was like, oh my God, if I can do right. that. Yeah, I know that that may be a little bit too much. Also, you know, it's it's not just you know, reading lines and, and following stage direction, but it's also, you know, adding your flavor and your interpretation to it too is also unlocking that that part of, of, of our personalities that um, it's like, well, you know, there's, you're not just a robot out there. You're, yeah. you're adding yourself to a performance. And I think, I think that helps us explore ourselves a little bit better in ways that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily be more, be comfortable doing. Yeah. So. That's a really nice way to put it. Actually. It does allow yeah. us to explore ourselves. I think that that's, that's, I, I hadn't like articulated it that way to myself, but I think, yeah, you're right on the money. It's nice. Can you tell me about a role that pushed you in ways that you didn't expect or um, mm. challenged you in ways or exhausted you um, yeah. in, in uh, th something that, that you walked away with going, wow, I did that. <laughs> no, or That's something that, great, something that no, touched you. That's a beautiful you. question. I think the thing that comes to mind is actually, it's, it's so funny how this stuff works. Like, you know, I've been lucky enough to be on like series for the full run of the series or like, you know, do movies where I have like a substantial thing. Like I've been I've been really lucky to get to, to do a lot of different things. The thing that's coming to mind is this just one episode of a show that I did called Flashpoint mm. um, because I I was asked to come in and play a woman who has a degenerative brain disease um, oh. facing the end of her life. And it was it just required like a really sensitive physicality and also uh the shoot was only like i don't know two weeks or something um and remember amy joe johnson was on the show and she was so uh, pink ranger so supportive man she's been so lovely um uh. when she's been in her life but i remember that uh, and luke kirby was the actor that i worked with on that show who's on uh, marvelous mrs Maisel now yes uh, yeah he's a fantastic actor so 
that that job for me just the I hadn't ever been um, asked to do something that was that level of um, emotional consequences, physical consequences. She was planning her own um, sort of early death because she wanted to avoid the deterioration. And then there was this like criminal aspect to it. And it was all within like the parameters of a week to week procedural. So it was the kind of thing that was like threading a needle. And, um, and uh, I just remember like every day going home, falling asleep immediately. Like I just really, really like feel like that was a job where I, I had the chance and I was able to just kind of leave it all on the floor. Um, and so it didn't to, follow you home. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> it, it, at first I think I was just kind of exhausted, but then okay. afterwards I remember having this a little mini grief spell afterwards, because I think the thing about physical roles, um, especially when there's any kind of like trauma or something, which there was in this, in this thing and not, not trauma in like, in like the, you know, in any kind of icky sense, it was just like a real emotional trauma uh, and some physicality. Mm. Your brain knows it's fake, but your body doesn't know it's fake. And so it can yeah. process through all I want in my brain and go like, well, that's work. Go, I'm going to go get like, you know, a burger with my pals or something. Yeah. But my body is still going like, wait, we just went through something like we're there's something something is not, you know, and I think that it was one of those jobs where that involved like on a, a few days, just like weeping for 12 hours a day which is not easy to do on the body because then the body's like, wait, we're in, we're in a, a crisis state, you know? So it reacts that way. Totally. It doesn't totally. know any better. Exactly. And so there's no amount of saying like, Hey, it's fake. We just a job. It's a job that the body will understand in those moments. So in that case I did. Yeah. I remember um, just going and uh, having really long bubble. Fits Cause that was the only thing that worked, but I yeah. do not understand how many actors can go through a dramatic performance of pretty much all of the kaleidoscope of ranges in mm -hmm. a bigger show, you know, five, six, seven times a week or more in a stage performance and still remain whole and sane. You know, mm -hmm. it's like when you have to, you have to laugh. You have to cry. You, 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 you know, you yeah. go, some some of these you know performance uh, performances encapsulate a character over over many years and many yeah. different trials. How do you do it without going nuts? Totally. Without your brain just saying, you know, I I can't take, I can't, I can't keep doing yeah. this. You know, even as in the material may be amazing, but how do you yeah, physically yeah. do it? It's almost <laughs> well, it's it's hard in a different way when the material is amazing. When the material is not great, you need to like. <laughs> really kind of like design an emotional interiority you know what i mean yeah. when it feels great it kind of does the work for you so you you feel it really in a full way um yeah theater i mean i see it I, i've been spending a lot of time in new york the last few years and I, I see a lot of theater and i marvel at those performers i grew up doing theater i i hope you know i have this like fantasy for myself to like retire on the stage at like stratford ontario mm -hmm. um but uh, I haven't done plays in a very long time. But the stamina <laughs> is unbelievable. And I have a friend who, uh, my friend Casey Levy, I grew up with in Hamilton. And she is a major Broadway performer. She's, you know, done the, all the big heavy hitters in the musicals and, and mm. all of this. Um, I saw her do, uh, she was Alphaba and Wicked. And I, like, oh, I've seen wow. her. Oh, wow. Okay. Like, she's really like a, a, a Broadway star. And that stamina, too. I'm like, I, you're doing, what, seven shows a week? I, I. I don't know. I don't know how they do it. Um, because to be truthful, you really have to go there. Yeah, but to say with Alphaba, for example, you yeah, know, yeah, hundred percent, even physically, like I, um, I did a show, uh, a, a series for Apple that, um, that I'm on la we shot last summer and, um, I play a cop and my partner in the, in the cop world has a limp. The character has a limp. So he would walk with a cane. And I was like, how do you do that? for six months and not totally mess up your hip. Like, how do you, it's like finding the ways to like really give to the work while not, you know, <laughs> wrecking our minds and hearts yeah. and bodies outside of it. And I think it's, it's a, uh, it's a delicate balance. I know for me, it's a, like, anytime I've had to really test my stamina, it's a matter of just insulating mm -hmm. outside. You're talking sure about that. city on fire, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think too, as an introvert, getting back to this, this is not something I think I've ever talked about publicly, by the way, being an introvert. Um, <laughs> it's good. Well, it is exercise good. those demons. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think as I get older too, I'm more and more comfortable with just admitting it. Yeah. And being, I do kind of get, like, and I do love being social sometimes. I'm a bit of a mix, but. Mm -hmm. Those are really ambiverts. But every once in a while, you got to get away, you know, yeah. more often, and, than, you know, than, than people think. Yeah, and so recognizing that to really feel uh, recharged and energized right. on certain jobs, I need to like limit social activity as well, or do so, you know things that make sure to, to to take care of myself in ways that might not be so so pressing otherwise. Tell us about getting Amanda Perry. Um, SGU <laughs> is yeah. my favorite of the three because mm. um, it's it's evolved the tools and the talent both in front of and behind the camera, uh, mm. to create this beautiful show, a dark show, mm -hmm. uh, a more realistic show. And one of those aspects was your character, this Stephen Hawking molded genius who was placed uh, in this horrible situation when she was a child, but still found a way to... Um, well, one of the one of the biggest brains on earth, probably. She's dealing with hyperdrive engines for crying out loud. Yeah. So she's got yeah. clearance by the State Department. So I mean, tell us yeah. about that role. Tell us about getting it. So getting that role is actually probably my favorite audition story in my entire career. Um, oh. Because I'll tell you how it went. So I was. I want to say I was like something like twenty six or so when I got the part. I was mid twenties when I got this this role. Yeah. I was auditioning for something else. I was auditioning for this show that was made by the, I forget what it's called, but it was made by the guys who did Baywatch. It was a pilot. I don't know if it actually went to series, but the guys who did Baywatch, it was a real Baywatchy show. It shot in Australia and I was auditioning for that. And I got right down to the end. And uh, <laughs> it was for this role that was like sexy, young, agile, beachy, you know, people on the beach. And uh, she's a marine biologist, but surfs and swims. And before I went in for the final meeting, um, I got a note from the casting director and they said, you know, just really come in. You're going to meet every the whole creative team for this show. Really come in with like youthful energy, agile energy. We want to see we want to feel athletic. We want to feel, feel beach. We want to feel young 20s, you know, really like sexy, beachy being like, OK, sure. So I went in, I did, I did the best thing I could. The other two girls I remember were like perfect, like beautiful, like, you know, little cutoff shorts and bikini tops. And I had on like a flowy, you know, some kind of palazzo pants or something. Um, so it's like, oh, I might be getting this a little bit wrong in my interpretation. But I went in, did the audition anyway, did my best version of like agile, athletic, sexy, beachy, young. And the casting director chased me out of the room and he said, um, hey, so you're not going to get this part. This is not going for you. But I was watching you thinking you just solved a problem for me because I have this other role that I think you'd be perfect for. Call your manager. Tell her it's Amanda Perry, Stargate Universe. And I was like, mm, OK, cool. Like I'd love to go to Stargate. I call my manager. I was like, hey, I'm not going to get the beach thing, but the Stargate. And she said, that's weird. Like, usually if there's a part that you're right for, it would be on my radar. Uh, and this one's not ringing a bell. So she's like, I'll look into it. And she called me back and she was like, well, it wasn't on my radar for you because um, the character is listed as a 40 year old quadriplegic and I was 26 trying to be athletic. <laughs> and she was like, you, we just didn't think that you would, you would be the right fit for this. Um, and so then I, but anyway, I, I was like, well, let's see, see if I can get it. And I went in, got it. And then later saw the casting director and I was like, what did I do? when I was trying to be the most agile, athletic, youthful beach girl that made you look at me and go, no, but what you are, you know, what I see in you is this scientist in space. And he was like, I don't know, you just like, there's just something about you. So I just found that to be such a funny thing where like, you never know what you're projecting in these rooms that like, um, I thought I was like really gunning for this one thing. And the a diametrically opposed like literally somebody who has not been in her body for you know 30 right. years or something is what i what he ended up seeing when i was trying to do this like different thing so i'm just really glad that it went that way you know that just is that is just wild because you know yeah. i love the 
the first um, uh, episode where she is freed of her physical form and she's on the ship and doesn't know what to do with her arms. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she's like, she has them up in space here for a while. And it's like, she's, she's not used to the signals coming to her brain. anymore. What was that like to portray? How much um, research did you do? Did you talk to quadriplegics? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a ton of time, but I look at videos. Like I looked at interviews. I looked at, um, some like doc content. Um, so I, yeah. And I, I was like, okay, well, what is this? This is like, it's the spinal cord. So it's not that like the, the, it's not that there are no muscles in here. It's just that the signals aren't there to make them move. And so I was like, okay, so what would it feel like? Also then she's in a different body. So she's in a body that hasn't atrophied, but so like, you know, it was, um, it was Ming-Na who I swapped with at that point, I believe Mm -hmm. in the first. Yes. That first episode. Yeah, Julia for a second and then me. And um, I and I remember being like, okay, so the muscles aren't atrophied because of someone else's body, but my familiarity with moving them is still, you know, not really there. So what would it feel like? And, and I just remember thinking, like, I don't think she's aware of the weight of hands. Like, I think hands, like, you know, the weight of them feels like a thing she's getting used to. And um and even just like the dexterity of fingers like the things that are um more nuanced than like you know large limbed movements um and being like i was like i think she's really enjoying i think there's some enjoyment and a little bit of fascination but also uh yeah it doesn't really doesn't really get that you can you know just drop your hands and they'll (laughs) they'll, like Mm -hmm. like that there's some kind of like connection to the um the weight of arms and hands that feels new um, and I remember a moment of eating a gooseberry or something. Mm-hmm. There's like a little like berry and pulling the, and it's like, yeah, like that kind of like fine motor stuff. Like, yeah. what does that feel like in feeding yourself? And uh-huh. what does it feel like to like, to like feel, um, you know, feel food, like just like that kind of process. And I was even thinking like, to what extent can she feel like when she drinks something, like, can she feel her body? Can she, mm-hmm. is she wear it? So just trying to let everything be a discovery and to be really conscious, like trying to be consciously aware of like, what does it actually feel like in a body? Like, what does it feel like to be in a body? And it's amazing. I mean, like if, you know, if you have any meditation practice or anything like that, you kind of know, like you do body scans and if you pay attention, you get surprised. Like Mm -hmm. there's stuff that we're, we're not consciously aware of in our own bodies all the time. So just trying to bring that sense of of newness and discovery and like pleasure. I think that was a thing I wanted to explore with her was just the pleasure of of like touching and sipping and, you know, um, and then, of course, it evolves. But, um, but you know, that <laughs> it's funny because you're uh, th- these people are uh, in a dark place, old, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. cut off from humanity. Um, you could describe it as purgatory in some cases. Yeah, um, yeah. The 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 hell that some of those people were were going through. You know, no caffeine, no nicotine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then a person comes in who is in this same place as them and is free for the first yeah. time in 15, 20 years. And it's like putting yourself in that place and mm-hmm. trying to understand, you know, that while she's in this world. She is, uh, she's free that it's just, it's, it's a wild, it's a, it's a wild sci-fi idea. And the fact that when it's over, she has to go back, Yeah, you know, like she, yeah. she this, this body is on loan, you on know? loan. And the first and one so- couldn't make it that Vanessa James, she couldn't, totally. she couldn't handle yeah. it. You yeah. Know? Um, doing the, uh, the, and also the idea that accomplishing the mission means leaving this freedom, right? Like that, like I'm here to do a job and once I'm done the job, that's it. And so I, I want to do the job. Well, it's like competing goals, right? Like I have the goal to like excel at what I do and to solve this problem that needs solving and also solving that problem means I'm not needed anymore. And that means I need to go back. And I think that was a, a complicated thing to play. Um, but I think it was, uh, yeah, it's interesting the like, I, cause even later on in the episodes that, that I was able to do where, um, where, 
Amanda becomes the consciousness in the, you mm -hmm. know, where I, the physicality of that one is different because I was like, okay, she's not really in a body now. She's mm -hmm. like, she runs down the hallway because she's like a little bit more of a ethereal spark or something mm -hmm. at that point. So I wanted to make that a little bit different. And, um, but also even there, even being able to be sitting playing chess with Rush, having this deep love with Rush, also simultaneously scanning the systems to try to solve problems, also investigating like curiosities out in the universe because the, the consciousness where it was was able to do multiple complex tasks at once, that she still would rather just be a human being. Like that, like the 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 limitations of just being on that, you know, kind of junky ship um, in a body that functions was still sort of what she was was hoping to be at that point. So yeah, it's it's a really uh, it is a great sci-fi premise for sure. Uh, tell me about working with um, Robert Carlyle, who called called Amanda Perry Little Miss Brilliant. <laughs> he was so lovely. We we got on really really well from the get, and uh, it's one of those funny things too because I know they they initially wrote the character uh, to be pitched a bit more close closer to his age. And then, so when I got the script, it had um, some lines about like, oh, you know, we used to be, I don't remember, it wasn't Academy, but it was like, oh, you know, we used to try to solve problems together, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that stuff's going to change because, you know, there's an age difference. So like, just realistically thinking about like where we would have been at, you know, years ago, uh, like, how is this going to work? But they didn't change it. And it just kind of worked because he, he I, I think we had, uh, it, he was able to offer me such a um, generous rapport that nothing felt contrived. Like it didn't feel like I was like pretending to be this like older, smarter scientist. It was just like, oh, these are two people who really relate on a human level, who have a past, uh, you know, that involves a lot of admiration for each other. And he just came in with like, like on equal footing. Mm -hmm. And I think I was kind of expecting to come in and be like a little bit like, you know, looking up to him or something or or like even just feeling like a younger kid beside him. So I think I don't know what our age gap was, but it's pretty substantial. And I went in and felt exactly on the same plane. Um, and I think, you know, in all the ways, I did not feel like we were competing for. Mm -hmm. um, Rush for was an interesting nut to crack because uh, as an audience, a lot of people didn't care for the character, but he he. um how do I want to put this? It's, this is a, one of the more complicated characters in, in all the oh, franchise. Yeah, totally. He, totally. he, there was a, there was a level of respect that he demanded, but he recognized super intelligence and others. And I think yeah. that in looking with, at Amanda Perry, I think he was in love with her brain and could just could come to her with problems. She could come to him with problems and they re, they respected each other's intelligence. And also yeah. there's, there's Eros there that's present yeah. obviously um and so they they their brains connected you know in terms of solving problems they there was a kinship there that was that was irrespective of age yes and also of circumstance like i think i really believe she felt with him and he probably like because rush is such a complex character and he's not um he's not warm and fuzzy no. you know he's not like um and i think because the, yeah you're totally right the currency he operates in is intelligence like i think he really that that's sort of you know yeah his point of interest and so i think she felt and i think she was right to feel that he was maybe one of the only people who immediately didn't condescend to her because she had a disability, mm -hmm. didn't you know treat her differently, or, or they have that what, that dialogue I thought was so beautiful um, about like oh I thought you pitied me. He says I thought you pitied me when we she, she was talking about like when they used to um, solve problems together and like the, when they first knew each other and she says you know did you have any idea how I felt about you and he said I thought you pitied me because he's assuming that she's sort of smarter than he is. And she's like, well, I thought you pitied me because, you know, of her circumstances. And I think it was really born. I think their connection was born out of this idea that he's one person that just sees the full human of her because he sees her brain and he's not seeing the chair and he's not seeing, uh, you know, the breathing tube or the, you know, the inabilities. He's only seeing the full human that mm -hmm. is, um, 
contained in her in her brain and her heart and all of that stuff. And I think that puts them, it kind of opens him up a little bit because there's someone who's able to get him on that level um, and, and, and inspire him a little bit on that level, I think. And, right. and for her, it's like someone who's finally treating her like just a human, you know, and, and not that, you know, I think there are probably other examples of that, but he's such an odd guy that I don't think the pleasantries of, you know, like the, the, the kind of, um, yeah, interpersonal conventions are all that important to him. But what's important to him is like, well, what do you have up here? Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that. because at that point, you know, in, in the series, we had seen him as someone who was threatened by intelligence, like with, with Eli. Mm. He, sure, he, yeah. Him and Eli took a long time to grow to some level of respect with one another. He also he always kept him at arm's length. He solved the 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 master problem of getting them on the ship and and Rush was resentful of that. But with Amanda it was just different and it added this level of complexity immediately to Rush um, because he wasn't like that with everyone. He was just like that just some some people, you know, they would, it's like when we meet people, there's something about you that just pisses me off, you know? <laughs> and yeah. it's and you're just projecting something. And it's like, you know what? I, I see who you are as a human being, but in terms of the personality, I'm I'm good to stay over here, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. just how it is with some people. You're, you can't, you're not going to like everyone, but then oh. you meet someone and there's a connection on some level, um, often regardless of age. And mm-hmm. it's something that's, that's beautiful and reminds us of what, how awesome it is to be human, regardless uh-huh. of our circumstances, what bodies we're in, you know? There's something sometimes we just connect with someone yeah. so and it was the, it, the those two it was it was beautiful it was great yeah and i really i mean i think so much of that is is bobby uh because he was just open and like you know when you come in for i think when i first went on i think i only I can't remember if i had even more than one episode like i think i was first they season just, it was one episode i mean for one episode yeah. and they brought me back which i was so happy about but you know when you go in for one episode like it's not it's not all the time that that there's that much openness, generosity, willingness to kind of bring someone in and, and really play, you know, um, but he was really, uh, really, really generous that way. It was such uh, a shock. And it was one of the questions of the show. When you're in the stone, when you're using the stones and in someone else's body, if one of them dies, what happens to the other? And uh, the the show answered that question in season two when Simeon, played by the amazing Robert Nepper, um, kills Gin uh, yeah. while Amanda is in her body. And that's how the episode ends. And in the next episode, we find out, no, they both died. Gin died in Amanda's body, and Amanda got shot while she was in Gin's body. Um, at that point, did you know you were going to come back later in the season? Did they did they reveal the the larger arc for the season at that point to you? And how did you feel about those those scenes? Because we don't see it on screen; it happens off screen. Oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I re- I remember that. Um, and the I look remember- on your face when the doors close. Oh man, yeah, the, like, that's so good. It's like, what's going on here? You know? Yeah, and Robert is like uh, Robert Nepper is just you know so convincing um, and a really nice guy from what I remember. But yeah, you know in that role. Um, yeah, I, I honestly don't, I don't remember, but I I don't think I knew I'd be back. Okay. Um, and I think what also, so yeah, I mean, I, I like really, really loved Amanda Perry. Like I really, I just like, as a character, I just loved playing her. I loved the relationship with Rush. I loved the discovery. Like there was, I felt very tender toward that character. So it made me sad when she died. Um, and and then it was interesting to come back because when she comes back, it's her, but it's not, it's, it is her, but then there's this this sort of like, I don't want to say she's, it's not nefarious, but she's, mm. you know, she kind of is doing this thing that's keeping Rush captive a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, and I think it's like, it was an interesting way to go with the character. Um, and of course, I don't think she had she had horrible intentions there at all. But it still kind of becomes this this um, problem. Op- yeah, and uh, and I really, in that way, got to kind of think about her. Man, like the loneliness. This is going to sound really heavy, but like 
wondering about the loneliness of dying like if there's if you could be conscious after death and recognize that you're no longer on earth, well not on earth in this case but you know you're no longer in a body yeah and what's happening to you you're displaced it's, yeah you know, where is she what's happening to you? it was one of the cooler mysteries of the show it was and what I is think, consciousness yes what is consciousness and also the idea of her just being kind of alone in it like so she wants this she wants company which feels very human and i think it's so it was just such an interesting way to think about technology i mean having her consciousness uploaded into technology and then being able to um be embodied in a simulation and then also just this idea of well, like the humanness in that case didn't die because the humanness wants connection the humanness wants company and wants to be embodied and want you know all of that stuff so i think the kind of grief around that was it just i remember it, it yeah it just kind of struck me because i was i kept being like well why like she's smart she loves rush you know she doesn't really want to keep him captive here she's it, but no. there are a couple tricks she plays right like you know the, the the saying that the the ship is is um in duress when it's not and like you know because she's trying to buy time to figure this thing out but she's not entirely honest with him in that episode mm -hmm. and i think part of i mean i think that that's because she's maybe embarrassed about the or, you know her the parameters she said or that we love mm -hmm. each other confront this this reality that maybe he doesn't love her the way she she imagines um and that's painful um but i think it's also like it was like, well, you know, it's it's not, it feels a like a little bit unlike her to be behaving in this way based on what I knew of her. And I was like, well, I think that's because her her heart is so open and a little bit breaking and she's lonely and in love and wants this so badly that she can't mm -hmm. let it go as easily as as maybe we expect this like hyper intelligent person to to be able to do we are human at the end of the day you know exactly. this despite our brain power and <laughs> we i can't help but you know see her as a very tragic character in her arc because she went from from someone who was unable to feel mm -hmm. to being transferred into a place where she could feel nothing where she could mm -hmm. make no physical contact with someone whatsoever she was ethereal to getting him finally in a place where she could have some kind of, of uh, uh, human contact with, with someone whom she really cared about. Mm -hmm. And then it was all pulled away. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's sad. It is sad. So. And I think too, that, that, the, the, that final kind of chapter for her also was not inhabiting anyone else's body and i think in i think that's really important too because there's always this and they deal with it a little bit in in the in the episodes that i that i did the ethics of romance in someone else's body mm -hmm. like if i pop into someone else's body and i'm going around mm -hmm. kissing someone that's like or making you know, love you know they dealt with that, that a little bit so a little bit yeah. there's an ethical question there and i think the the amount of freedom in that last episode or the last you know the last little chapter for her um, is so substantial because she's it's her autonomy you know she's it's her her agency um but yeah it is it's very it is very sad it was very sad to, to play i remember being very sad yeah i um it's it's one of the uh uh the regrets of uh the show ending when it did because we know that they would have you know pulled them out of protected memory and and tried some some more things with with those characters at some point later on and i think that i think that your character was going to be integral into the mystery of of what was going on with uh, the ship and and its mission what do you th what do you think destiny was was uh constructed for had you ever had you thought about it i think back then i uh... as a sci-fi fan i'm i'm curious for your input I think I have to go back and like watch the whole thing again. Uh -huh. Cause it's, it, what do you think? Um, they have, a, they have, they have uh, made contact with a signal that's embedded in the, the fabric of the universe itself and have sent the ship out to discover it. What I was curious about, and it, this lends into my theory of like how this, how this was d determines the direction of my theory um were the was the ship communic uh, 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 
gathering information as it traveled or was it heading to some kind of boundary to then figure out what what's going on Mm -hmm. and i i don't know i (laughs) i've gone around this so many times i think that it was going to be uh knowing brad and and rob i think it was going to be something profound and not just like oh that's that's all it is you know I i think it would have been one of those larger uh, what ifs to the meaning of life, you know, yeah. was it destiny that, that had, that had created reality, you know, and it's just going and finding like, go, go to the edge of the cosmos or whatever, or, although there's no outer boundary and like seeing a mirror of itself there and then, and then creating uh, reality itself or starting over again, or I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. But it You're was, right. I suspect it was going to be wild. Have they ever given, you know, hints or David like, Blue. Did... David Blue knows. Does um, he? And uh, he knows some. And yeah. Brad Wright once told me that it, it, what, that ultimately, or at least the next one of the next parts would have been uh, Stargate Command and Atlantis pooling their talents together to save Destiny. But wow. have they haven't explored um, or hinted at the the nature of of her mission, which you know always leads me to to hope that something will come out later on. Yeah, yeah. But it's wild. Yeah. You know, what could be out there? You know, it's yeah. it's 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 reality defining stuff. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I have some fan questions for you. Yeah. Um, Philip Philippe Canat, uh, how was your experience on the show? Were there any particular rem- moments that you remember fondly? Yeah, I, I loved my time on the show. I really loved my time on the show. I think the things that, that I remember uh a couple of things. I remember that in the last episode, I think it was last episode, or the last one of the last two, Helen Shaver directed. She's amazing. Mm. Really, like, we took so much time on the relationship stuff. And for a show that was so much about the the sci-fi and whatever, I just remember thinking, like, this feels like like acting camp or something. Mm-hmm. Like, it was a really, really beautiful moment to work with Robert and with her. Um, I remember really... <laughs> really well the um the first scene in the, in the first episode the scene with um with robert in in the still where we take the little shot and <laughs> robert's cheers was uh it was something scottish like up your kilt or something yeah. <laughs> and, like, i kept laughing every time he'd say it because it just uh, i don't know i gotta kick out of it. it's one of those images that gets into your head it's like okay i gotta i gotta perform yeah. now <laughs> yeah, oh, I can't. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I definitely had the giggles, so I do remember that and trying to like bring it in. Yeah, but it was it, like it was really, really a nice time on that show. Like, really, really a treat. The whole thing. He also wanted to know what it felt like um, uh, when you heard heard the news about the show being canceled. I don't. I mean, I actually really love your your idea that I might have been back. I think I. I had come to really love the show and I really, really love the people on the show. And so I was sad to not be able to see more of it and to not, you know, to, to have that uh, kind of end sooner than I thought it, it, it could have. Um, I, I didn't assume I'd be back. And I think that's maybe my limits of my imagination, not getting into the sci-fi potentials as much as I maybe could. <laughs> this is I a continuing I, story, Kathleen. Yeah. Cause it was like, I died, then I lived. Then I died. Like how many times? <laughs> die, but I would have definitely wanted to to prove that I could have come back more and more. Um, so personally, I just you know it was more just my my feelings about the show in general and and the people on it that I was I was like yeah quite sad. It is that thing of like sort of like what you're you're asking about the ship's mission. Like when when a story isn't finished, mm. we want that ending, you know. And so uh, and I think there were so many there was there was a lot more that could have been discovered. I, uh, L. Lee wanted to know uh, which of these episodes were your favorite. Ooh. You came in f- with sabotage, came back for the greater good, and then hope and seizure. Yeah, I think it's a t- it would be probably a toss up between the first and the last because yeah. they both were, were complex in different ways. And the first was so much about the discovery. And the like, it's the, you know, kind of like finding that connection with with Rush and uh, and finding the character, which is always like a really really fun and interesting process. And like the discovery involved in that was just mm-hmm. so much fun. And it's 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 fun too to have played 
discovery while also discovering an experience myself, right? It was the mm -hmm. first time I, I, I got there, I jumped into it, you know, so everything was new. Um, the last episode, just the, the emotional complexity and the, the connection, like kind of seeing that connection through with Rush. And there's also something, I can't remember what episode it's in. And it, I, I'm honestly like, was it even on screen? But I sit in the, I do, I sit in the captain's chair on the bridge, I believe. Is this the, I'm trying to, I, trying I think. to remember that. It's, it's quite possible, yeah. All I know is that there was a point when I got to sit in the chair on set. And I was like, because of my deep Star Trek love, I was like, <laughs> I'm, here, I'm, doing, I'm here. Like, it just felt like such a trip to be like, you know, looking at this set and stuff. There, there's an exchange between, I think it's, uh, I think it's between uh, uh, Ming-Na and uh, the actor who plays uh, uh, Young, uh, Telford. Uh, mm -hmm. Excuse me, Young. Um, and he, tur uh, he turns, uh, Ming-Na sits uh, uh, down and in, in she's in the chair, or I can't forget the situation, but they're, they're arguing over the captain's chair. And he says, yeah, yeah. what am I, Captain Kirk? Sit down. You know, <laughs> there's a seat right there. So I loved how the show recognized that uh, it it wasn't didn't take itself too seriously, and it yeah. allowed the audience to to play into the into the the humor of that. So Louis Ferreira, his character, yes, and Ming yes, they were great. Yes, and you're right too about um about it being important, like the the time setting, like the setting of the of the show in time mm -hmm. is really because cool those references play right. You know, like we're not talking about a future where nobody knows who Captain Kirk is. Like we're talking about about life here and now. Uh, the time profits. Do you find as a Canadian actress you have to go to the U.S. to find work? How's that can the U.S. dynamic play for you as as a performer? I feel like one of the really, really lucky ones because I have an American mom and a Canadian dad. So okay. I've two sports and I've spent a lot of my life. I, I'm Canadian, obviously, um, and grew up, you know, I love my hometown mm -hmm. very, very proudly from where I'm from. Also, my mom certainly is from Buffalo. So I spent a lot of time like um, back and forth. And uh, I would say what I just am lucky to not have to choose because I think there's some really exciting stuff happening in Canada. We shot this in Canada, although I was booked on this in the States. So it's sort of, um, I don't think you have to leave to get work. I think anything that helps expand opportunities, like any kind of extra pots you can put your hand in, um, can only bring a higher volume of opportunity. Right. So I think, um, I, yeah, I feel really, really lucky to be able to have pretty, like, from a um, citizenship status point, mm. a point, like a really easy access point to both industries. Um, yeah. And I think it's it's changing now. It used to be when we, when we would have to audition in person all the time, it really made sense to be in LA sometimes to get the FaceTime with the people who make these decisions. Mm -hmm. um, Nowadays, I think less so because everything's remote. So. Yeah, there are advantages to that. I, 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 I fear our loss of our, our continued loss of face-to-face uh, -face contact. Uh, totally. I really think that it's hurting us. At the totally. same time, you know, as long as uh, we recognize that these tools that we're using, they're tools. You know, they're they're not designed to replace anything. They're designed to augment. Um, if we can keep our head on our shoulders, I think we'll be okay. Let's bring that into the AI conversation as well. <laughs> oh man, have you played with any of it? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. But I think you're like the way you just described even Zoom. I feel like is is the the sensible way to think about AI as well. That it's you know let's use this as a tool to not replace things but enhance what we can. Yeah. Absolutely. Jeremy Heiner wanted to know in 2021 you wrote a piece for the Toronto Star entitled "It's Time to Redefine Queer Cinema." Can you talk more about that? And has anything changed in the industry since you wrote it? Oh man, thank you for that question. Jeremy's um, a digger. He'll go and find stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so. appreciate that, Jeremy. Um, yeah, look. So this this is um this was something that I because I'm I'm uh, a screenwriter as well, and I have some projects in development as a director. I've done a little bit of directing, but I'm sort of newer to it. Um, I think. I think my take on on this sort of issue of narrative authority is that. No one should say that people can't tell other people's stories, that people are incapable of telling other people's stories, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think the issue is one of like, can people 
make interesting work about a group of people or a person or whatever that they have no connection to. I think we've seen a lot of examples of like, yes, they can. I think what I feel though is that for a very, very, very long time, i.e. kind of the like duration of the um, the film industry, there's been an over-representation of, um, in, this, in the case that I was talking about, like straight perspective on queer content. And uh, I'm not saying that like, look, Beau Travai, the, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite movies. I love the favorite. There's some, there's some stuff that I think is mm, you know, really yeah. beautiful work made by straight people that involve queer characters. So I'm not saying it's impossible. What I'm saying is it's tough sometimes to, you know, be a queer person, seeing queer narratives and not relate and feel like this is how people are getting educated on me and my community. And it, the, it, it, the analogy that I use sometimes with people is imagine you wanted to make a story about your family and you love your family and you know your family, you know all the nuances of your family and you're, you're trying to make this movie about your family. And then all the most powerful, famous people in the world start making movies about your family and getting your mom wrong and getting your dad wrong and getting you wrong. But they have a lot more money and power. It's 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 it hurts a little bit to see, you know, things that don't connect because the, um, the, the you know, if the care is not being taken or if the authority isn't there. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a point about what's possible or impossible. I think at a certain point, it, it would be great if we can get to the, the, the place where, where enough people have been given the opportunity to tell their own stories mm -hmm. and maybe even other stories. Like I'm interested in seeing, you know, um, more diverse filmmakers telling action, making action movies with white stars who are straight, you know, like I'm interested mm -hmm. in shifting the perspective. Like if we can do it entirely in one direction by, and by that, I mean, in the case that I was arguing, like, you know, if it's been almost entirely, you know, in terms of large movies, straight people making gay movies, let's, let's have some gay people making straight movies for a little bit. And then let's yeah. talk, <laughs> then let's talk about maybe, you know, we can we can sort of start opening that conversation up a little bit more. I I, I, I love looking at like Neil Patrick Harris. You know, yeah. who I mean, his mo some of his most successful roles are as a as a, a straight man. You know, okay. but so he can go backwards and forwards. And I wish you know I, I wish that yeah. we could all like open ourselves in all the different in, uh, 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 parts of the industry in, in yeah, that direction I, as well. I can't help but wonder sometimes because I don't I don't know that he was he was publicly out when Not, he got published in that. I and I think yeah he, yeah. I ask myself that question. Like, I don't. I. I hope he would still would have gotten cast. But you know, from what I see, sometimes I do wonder. And I think, um, yeah. And again, it's not to say that. I was talking about filmmaking, but it's mm. not to say also that straight actors can't play gay characters in a phenomenal, convincing, mm. beautiful way. I'm just saying, you know, I don't hear people offering Tignataro the role of like the wife on a sitcom to right, a man. Right, exactly. That's true. <laughs> That's true. But I mean, have you seen like Gone Girl? You know, to to keep on Neil for a second here, he's brilliant in that, and he's he plays a straight guy. So, but I think behind the scenes, you know, in terms of the filmmaking, I think that that would be, it, it should continue to grow. And I think that's one of those things moving forward. I think being aware of that is, I think, yeah. the first step in getting there. That's so. the thing, because I think it's it's really easy for people to feel attacked and I get it. It's easy for people to go like, oh, you're telling me I can't make something. You're telling me I can't do something. It's like, absolutely not. I'm just saying like, I'll speak for myself. I'm really more interested in seeing a wider variety of voices mm -hmm. behind the lens and uh, keep making your stuff. But also, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can just widen our scope a little bit mm -hmm. because I'm, a, you know, first and foremost, a film lover. And so what could be bad about opening doors to a wider range of perspectives. I think it's only going to make everybody's work better. And if there's um, an audience for it, they'll come and see it. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred. Yeah. So, Melissa Smith, how did uh, you, how did Kathleen like her time and role in Haven? She's a lovely actress. I enjoy her work. Oh, thank you. And thank you for asking about Haven. Haven was a blast. Haven was a blast. I, um, that's another one where I thought I was going in for like an episode or something mm. and I ended up going back and had a really interesting arc on that, like the um, the Audrey Fraudry thing. Um, Emily is the sweetest, like she was one of those people that when I met her, you know, she's so beautiful. She's the lead of the show. Mm. And I remember getting it and I was like, oh, she's just the most down to earth, normal person in the world. Um, 
and I had a, like Lucas was really great and uh, Eric like it it was just such a fun fun show and shooting in Nova Scotia I, I shot a series in Nova Scotia for four years wow. I did Haven as well and it is uh, like the crews out there the views out there not to yeah. rhyme um, I mean everything about being out there was just a joy wow it was, yeah, it's yeah. one of those places that I've always wanted to go just it's just wide open space it is. <laughs> no. we're just and it's that craggy atlantic ocean like I right. don't know. yeah do you have time for a couple more totally yeah okay misadventures of a little wolf could you under okay okay let me let me back this up so <laughs> uh elena huffman yeah she's she's across from the table with bobby carlisle and they're getting ready to do their first screen read for sgu mm-hmm. and bobby is very low and soft and his accent is so thick and she's thinking to herself Oh my God, we are screwed. No one is going to understand this actor. And then the, the, they, they start to, uh, going through the material and he rises up and he's right there. And she was like, oh my God. So, <laughs> she's, so misadventures of a little wolf. Could you understand a word Bobby was saying when oh, he was being so normally funny. Scottish? That's so funny. <laughs> um, okay. I do remember he sounded a little more Scottish offset than on. Um, yeah, for sure. I have the benefit of I'm, my my lineage is mostly Irish, but it, my dad's side has a lot of Scottish on it. So we've been to Scotland. My dad loves Scottish culture, mm. loves the accent. So I've been at least like I'd been primed enough in it to like I'd say catch I'm gonna say seventy percent, seventy five percent maybe of what he was saying. <laughs> and was so like he, I loved him from the day I saw him in Train Spotting like years oh. ago. In- between train spotting, full Monty, you know, yeah. talk about needing to decipher language, but um, <laughs> but it's just I think there's something about him too that's so like present and empathetic mm-hmm. that you know you get the idea even if you don't get all the words. We haven't talked about your music, um, mm-hmm. so if you uh, once you're finished watching the show or during the show, if you want to click over, uh, scroll down in the description and you'll see a link to Spotify. Um, for, for Kathleen's music. She's, she can be found under Monroe. Uh, tell me about this part of yourself, expressing this part of yourself. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I, um, it's, I've always played music my whole life. Like I, I started, I don't remember not playing music. It's been like um, just a, yeah, I, I, I started playing piano when I was like, I don't know, three or something. Four. Um, mm. And uh, it just feels like the, it's a part of my, creative life that I don't really commodify like it I now and then like will license something to a project often for free sometimes you know for something nominal just you know uh for formality but I don't really like try to make money off music Mm. and I think that's kept it in this I did like there was a minute where I when I first came out with with my first album where I worked with a label and very quickly I was like I don't think this is for me like this is not this is not what I want to do with this part of my creative life. I want it to be sort of protected a little bit pure. and not have anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be pure about it, to not really worry if like people think it's good or if like a, a label thinks it's sellable or mm-hmm. like, I just want to be able to make it. And the joy for me is in making it. And I, because I've always made music, there was a certain point where I was like, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's actually really done until it's out in the world. And then when it's right. out in the world, you kind of move on, you know? Um, so the joy for me is like the writing and the playing and the playing with other people and the collaborating around production and stuff like that. And and so that's where I really, I mean, I feel so lucky that I get to work in an industry where I get time off, you know, where we get right. like paid in a way where we, we work. And then, you know, if we're lucky. There's, there's moments of time between jobs where, um, you know, you can kind of devote attention to other things. And, and so it's been just a real music's been a real like companion of mine, I'd say for my whole life. I've been listening to your stuff for a couple of days now. And, um, you remind me a lot of Billie Holiday. Oh. There is, there is a, there is a moodiness. There is a swing, you know, kind of a, a almost a swagger to the music. And I invite anyone to, to go and, and check your stuff out. And, you know, there, I, I love, and I, I've had this conversation with a couple of actors, you know, there, there are some parts of your creative life that you monetize to pay the bills. And there are other parts over here that, no, no, we're, I'm, I'm not going to compromise on this thing. Yeah. You know, this is how I want it to be. And everyone else can go fly a kite. Yeah. 
Totally. So. And that I will I will be the first one to say is a luxury. Yep. It is luxury to get income from one source, especially a creative source. Mm -hmm. I I just, you know, did my taxes recently and every year I do my taxes I go I make money, you know, saying other people's words on TV. It's wild. Like, you know, that that in and of itself just feels like a tremendous amount of luck. Um and so to have the the luxury of of time and income from somewhere else to be able to have a hobby that's purely creative is like, and I mean, you can do it in all kinds of ways, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't you know, do it for, for a lot. And certainly I've had times in my life where I'm making music for $0 uh, on, you know, recording into my own computer to just do it. So but you're nourishing ways. your soul. Exactly. And that's the point. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's like we find a way to get these creative things um, stoked and, uh, no matter what. And then, you know, when, when there is like this, the space allowed by mm -hmm. having a, a job that pays the bills, um, mm -hmm. carve out time for those hobbies. It's, it's, uh, it's really it's important. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's important that we have those, those aspects, you know, in our life as, as creative people, people ask me, why don't you try to monetize this show? Hmm. Um, it, we get, I, I get YouTube's revenue. It pays for my, it, most of my cell phone bill every month. That's not why yeah. I do it. I, get yeah. to be, I, yeah. I want it to be free for, for the yeah. world and, you know, for the future, for people who discover the franchise. And it's so important to me. And I'm so thankful that you have sat down to to take this hour plus uh, with me to to share your stories and, and to archive them for the oral history project. It, it means a lot that you've uh, that you've come here and and spent uh, time today with me. Yeah, I mean, it means a lot to me that you're doing this project and that you keep doing it from such a, you know, like from a, a, a real genuine place in your heart. It, it's it's a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Me. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great show, and I think uh, I think we'll see we'll see more of it now that Amazon is is cooking something up. We'll we'll see what it is. And would would it, are you open to Amanda Perry coming back? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Who do I need, who do I need to call? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. You know. Ah, uh, right. thank you so much, Kathleen. It's it's been a, a a privilege to have you and and to to uh, share in your 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 thoughts on these subjects and and your creativity and and uh, again, thank you for for playing that role so masterfully. So, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. You take care of yourself. I'm going to go ahead and close things out on this end. Bye bye, Kathleen Monroe. Everyone, Amanda Perry in Stargate Universe. Thank you so much for tuning in today um this is uh, uh this this passion project is is continuing to grow we're just we're clicking along here um she was uh she was so kind to reach out to me a, a few days ago and and say yeah that i i I messaged her agent a while back and uh she she reached out and said yeah i'm i'm, I'm here i'm interested so uh we, we made it happen so and thank you uh to my moderating team for for making uh, this episode possible to to jeremy and to anthony uh thanks to my producer linda gate gabber fury and uh, frederick marcu at concepts web he keeps our website up and running uh when we have uh more interviews on the slate i will reach out to you guys and uh, we'll get that going i'm still in la working on a project and so my dates are still up in the air so uh, wormhole extremist is on hold although those girls are making some great memes so go ahead and check us out on the social channels uh, i think that's uh, all that we have here lock watcher maybe kathleen could watch an sgu episode with us wormhole extremists we will see about that, but it's going to be a few years before we get to SGU. So I would definitely want to have her along for her first episode as well. We're getting some uh, some cast commentary, so I will reach out to her about that. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you on the other side. <laughs>